Our next speaker is all about perseverance, resilience, finding opportunity, and making her dreams happen. Lindsey Vaughn is the greatest female skate skier of all time. She's also an author, a businesswoman. She's an entrepreneur. She's an inspiration. She created a foundation. We're going to have an opportunity to talk about all of that. But to set the stage to help you know how high she was, how far she fell, and the peak that she accomplished in the, in the ski profession is just unbelievable. Please watch the video. We'll see Lindsay. Rip it up. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Head of the course. Come on. Come on. Come on. Hey, my baby. Let's go. Come on. It is Lindsay Vaughn greatest American skier of all time. When I dreamed of being an Olympian, I never imagined I would make it this far. I never dreamed I could accomplish so much. and that my name would be in the record books. A record that has stood for 35 years and Lindsay Vaughn across the line. And that is looking like a legend in the making. It's been a long road, but I've enjoyed every step of the way. The victories. Lindsay Vaughn chasing down another victory. record breaker all around and it seems like there's no way to slow this woman down and even my failures oh and Lindsay Vaughn goes down into the fencing by far the most painful injury I've ever had by a long shot it was my I could feel my bones hitting together and uh, hitting the nerve and it was brutal like, when I'm laying on the ground, I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me. How, how do I keep doing this? It was all worth it. Victory number 61. Is she back? Oh, and Lindsey Vaughn is back. Being out for two years with two uh, major knee operations was definitely hard. And to come back this year to get the downtown title again, um, and to have just a, an amazing season means so much to me. I'm so proud and happy and want to thank everyone who supported me and um, got me back to where I am now. They have all made me the strong, fearless competitor that I am. I, you know, I've always dreaded sold and it's always the first race. I'm always so nervous and, you know, to come out today, first race of the season with a win, my first GS win in my career, it's, words can't describe, it's amazing. I hope I've left a legacy behind, that I'm more than a ski racer, that I was a great teammate. McKennis pulls into third, and so it's two Americans on the podium. There's some kind of uh, momentum that's happening with this American team. A good person. On the top of the podium again, and also with my other two teammates, you know, it, couldn't, it really couldn't be a better day. And an inspiration to others that anything is possible if you work hard enough. Lindsay Vaughn, welcome to NBAA. Thank you. Great to be here. So 
Now, we had an opportunity to see the video, and I'm anxious to talk with you about that, but clearly you are so identified with the Olympics. Uh, Three-time medalist, gold medalist at the Olympics. They're coming up this year. It'll be the first time you are not participating in the Winter Olympics. Tell me about your thoughts as you now take a different step and will be participating in a different format. Um, I definitely have some FOMO, <laughs> for sure. Um, I really wish that I was competing. You know, it's been a, it's been a long transition for me. I mean, I, you know, obviously when you um, are an athlete, you know that there's always going to be a, a moment of retirement and when your career is over. But still, the transition was was hard, and so. Um, I'm in a great place now, but I think the Olympics coming up, you know, is going to be just another reminder that I'm not going 80 miles an hour anymore, at least not um, on the slopes. But um, I'm excited to watch my teammates and to watch Team USA, and you know, hopefully this Olympics will be um, a little bit better than than Tokyo as far as you know having spectators, hopefully, right. and just being a better experience. But um, I love the Olympics. I always have thought that they've been very inspiring. Um, event for me in my life and I know too many of my friends so I'm excited to watch it and you will be part of it in a sense you are an ambassador to Team USA yeah I definitely am I mean um, I also work closely with uh, the Olympics the IOC and um, the Youth Olympic Games so um, uh, President Bach invited me to join unfortunately I can't go but um, you know, I, I, I love being a part of the Olympics in whatever way is possible. Um, again, I think it's just a really inspiring event, and I always love, you know, learning the stories of athletes and, you know, overcoming their adversities, and, um, yeah, so I'm excited. And, you know, uh, Monday we had an opportunity, we heard that a partnership has been signed, Textron Aviation and the Snowboard and Ski Foundation is, uh, is in partnership on this. Uh, which which had me thinking, you know, what do what do partnerships like that mean for the athletes as they try to prepare and go forward and the opportunities that it affords them? Um, they mean so much to us. I mean, you know, the U.S. is a little bit different than most nations. Um, we don't have government funding. So especially with the ski team, you know, we, we need all the help that we can get. And this partnership with Textron is amazing because not only do we get, you know, the flight support that we need, but, um, you know, the, the planes that they've created for the U.S. ski team, part of those proceeds go to the U.S. ski team, U.S. ski and snowboard team, and help fund um, their journey, all the athletes' journey to the Olympics. And, you know, none of us would be able to be where we are without that support. So it's a, a really impressive partnership, and I think everyone's very excited. So, so let me ask you a little bit, uh, you know, you talked about fear of missing out and you knew at some point a time would come when you wouldn't be the athlete, but you know, you participated in multiple Olympics. You were at the top of the game in 2013 when you were injured severely. Was there ever a question on whether that was the end because you could have stopped there and still been a legendary female skier, a, a world-recognized figure. Did quitting ever come into your mind? No, I never thought about quitting, especially not after the first injury. You know, in 2013, as you said, I was in an amazing position, and um, it was really the pinnacle of my career. And I really focused then on the Olympics, coming back for Sochi in 2014. Um, and then, unfortunately, eight months later, I retore my ACL and went through the whole process a second time. And I will say that second time and missing the Olympics was really, really hard. Um, you know, really a dark moment for me. But I never questioned quitting because I always, I always knew how much I loved the sport. And being injured just made me realize even more how much I loved it. Um, and you know, as much as the times were tough, I, I wanted to get back on the skis, whether it was com uh, to compete or not. I just wanted to be able to ski again. Um, and you know, every day I inched closer and closer, and I finally made it back and was able to get back to winning. And um, it was a long road, but I I came out on top. Well, you you do talk about uh, and just mentioned kind of being in a dark spot for a period. You've been open about that, and you've helped people understand there are dark times when you need others and you need help. Of course, I mean, you know, no athlete can do anything without a huge support team. You know. 
um, you know, text on just one of the many that, that helped support us. And, um, you know, without my parents, my family, my physical therapist, my ski technician, you know, there's so many people that go in to make um, an athlete successful. And, um, you know, especially during those dark times, I, I really relied heavily on the support of my, of my team and my teammates and um, was lucky enough to have such great people around me to really rally behind me and help me through it. So then, then you come back and it's, it's 2016 and you publish the book, Strong is Beautiful. Tell us a little bit about becoming an author for the first time and what that felt like to tell your story. Uh, it was a new challenge for sure, but you know, I felt like I learned so much in my career from nutrition to you know, working out to just taking care of your body. And I was really discouraged by you know, our society's image of what beautiful is. And you know, I think beautiful comes in a lot of different shapes and sizes. And as long as you take care of yourself and you're confident in who you are, that's the most important thing. So it's really why I wrote the book. Um, and I was really, uh, you know, again, it was a challenge, but I was really happy with his success. And, you know, so many women came up to me and were, you know, obviously happy that, that I wrote it because it's the messaging and um, it was very rewarding in a lot of ways. Of course, then you, you have the book in 2016. You've now had both knees injured and then you injure your arm. Uh, it's a long list. <laughs> the list is long. <laughs> there is a long list. <laughs> we need a whole nother talk for that. <laughs> All right, so let's fast forward through that and just get to uh, 2019. Now you're clearly in every respect standing on the top of the world. Uh, but you decide to close that chapter and move on to something new. How do you think through what comes next? When do you make that mental transition to we're now into a new chapter? Well, I mean, as I said, you know, as an athlete, we all know we have an end point. And so my dad always taught me to really think about the future. And honestly, my entire career, I've thought about the future and, you know, what I would do. And that's kind of why I've approached my career, you know, kind of off the slopes in the way that I did. Um, because I was always thinking about that moment. But then when the moment came, it was much harder to transition than I thought. And, um, you know, it's, you never wanna, if you're on the monkey bars, you never wanna let, you know, your one hand go until you have your hand on the other one. And I just kinda had to let go of both and just jump. And, um, you know, again, it took me a little while. I, you know, without the adrenaline and the competition, it was a struggle, but um, now I found my footing. I'm, you know, really heavy into business and I'm, you know, working with some venture capital funds and, um, you know, starting a few of my own businesses. So it's been very exciting. And I've, my new memoir is coming out. My next book's coming out in January. So I've been very busy. I like to stay busy. I like to work hard. And uh, it's been very rewarding. But uh, it's been an interesting road, that's for sure. So you've done so many things as an entrepreneur. Uh, tell us about a couple of those. I know you've started a production company with uh, some other kind of legendary people. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, kind of right when I was uh, finishing my career, I started my own production company called Opry Productions with a good friend of mine that I grew up with in Minnesota. And our first project uh, is doing a documentary on Peekaboo Street, who is my childhood idol. And I, I met her when I was nine years old at an autograph signing. And that was the reason why I became an Olympian was because of her. Um, and so to be able to interview her and work with Frank Marshall, who is legendary, I mean, he's probably one of the best directors in the business, um, was incredible, an incredible opportunity for us. And we have a lot more um, projects and executive producing a couple of shows. And, um, you know, it's just all very exciting and a whole new world. But, um, you know, to be able to interview and do a documentary on your childhood idol is it's pretty extreme, it's pretty awesome. So I'm sure you know and feel all the time that you are an inspiration to others and that a lot of what you do helps others see themselves achieve the kind of success that you do. How do you take that, not just as an athlete, but as an author, as a business person, uh, how, how do you use the platforms that you have to make sure it's not just about building a brand or selling products, it's about inspiring others to live their dreams and have that combination of uh, preparation, meeting opportunity. Well, I mean, to be honest, a lot of it goes back to when I met Peekaboo when I was nine. Um, I met her and she was the most positive, charismatic person and it really changed 
my approach to my future. And the same day, I also met another racer who I ran into in the bathroom, and she wouldn't give me her autograph, and I was nine. And so I had two really clear images of what you know, someone being positive and kind to you means and what someone who is not so kind means and what that, you know, what that feels like as a kid. So whenever I approach, you know, kids at a, at a race or, you know, how I present myself in the media or, you know, what I'm writing about in my book, I always think about, you know, what is a kid going to say if they read it and what is a kid going to feel if I meet them and, you know, I. Obviously, I can't sign everyone's autograph and I can't take everyone's picture, but I certainly do my best to be that positive person that makes a positive impact on, on people and especially on children. So I'm, I'm thinking about you at nine years old meeting idols, but it had an even bigger influence. I think that is where you decided you were going to learn to speak German because you were going uh, to Austria and other places. And tell us about a commitment like that. You're already uh, a ski protege. Uh, now you've got desires to do lifelong learning beyond becoming the world's greatest skier. Well, I went on my first international ski trip when I was nine by myself without my parents um, to Austria. And, you know, I was over there and I, I couldn't speak with any of the kids because I obviously I was nine and, you know, kids my age were nine and they didn't speak English. So I came home and I said, Dad, I want to learn how to speak German. And he was like, why do you want to do that? I, like, I want to be able to speak to all the kids and ski. And you know, in our in skiing community, German is probably the number one language. And I felt like you know, if I wanted to be a part of the skiing culture and the skiing history, that I needed to learn that language as well. So um, it took me a little while, but I'm fluent. And um, I'm very proud of that. And I'm, you know, I love communicating with people in, in the ski community, and um, I just think that kind of went to, you know, my lifelong learning and, and, you know, how I approach, you know, ski racing. It wasn't just about, you know, winning, but it was about, you know, the whole sport as a whole. And I, and I think that willingness to sense, here's what I need to do, I'm going to do it. I mean, you've always been known for your fearlessness, and so as you start your own cosmetics company, as you launch your own production company, as you put yourself out there with reality TV, how, how has that fearlessness shaped you? I will do this, I'll figure it out. I know where I want to go and I'll make it happen. Well, I think it's the willingness to know that you're not the smartest person in the room. And, you know, I always realize that everyone's smarter than me and I assume that everyone's stronger than me and so it's my job to be able to work as hard as I can, to be as smart as I can be, and to be as strong as I can be. And, you know, it's a fearlessness to, to understand that I'm not the best. And so I, I, I take that approach in everything I do, um, especially now in this new phase of life. You know, I go into every room and I try to learn from everyone that I meet. And, um, you know, everyone is incredibly smart in their own way. And so if I can learn a little bit from every person, then that's only going to make my life a little bit easier, hopefully. But um, yeah, you know, I think skiing taught me so much about about that and about working hard. And I don't fear failure because I know um, that just teaches me a lesson. And if I continue to work hard, I'll learn enough lessons to hopefully be successful. Well, and obviously doing all that you're doing, you need to be as efficient as possible with your time. I suspect business aviation <laughs> yeah. helps you be more places in less time and be more productive. Yes, it does. I mean, I've had so many times where I've had an evening event and had to fly, you know, directly after the event to make it in time to, you know, West Coast to be able to speak in the morning at another event. Um, you know, the efficiency for my business is, is critical. You know, I obviously I make money, you know, being in places. So if I can't be at that place, you know, I don't make money. So um, <laughs> it's pretty important. Um, and also, uh, side note, my dogs, um, you know, are very large. And so I usually fly, fly, fly private, and not when I'm doing business, but just for my dogs because, you know, <laughs> they're important. Well, you, you, you talk about going from, from place to place and, and the importance of getting there uh, to seize the business opportunity, but you also, you give back. 
Uh, you've, got, you've got a foundation, you provide scholarships, you've touched hundreds of lives through that. Can you talk a little bit about your scholarships? Yeah, I mean, we have a great scholarship program, um, and our mission is to empower and inspire young girls and boys. Um, we did have in-person camps, we called them Strong Girls Camps, which were amazing, and you know, because of COVID, we haven't done them in about two years, but we're really looking forward to expanding into Europe and um, really engaging more kids. And our, our mission, again, is to, we just really want to inspire kids, you know, it goes back to me meeting Peekaboo. And I met her for 90 seconds, and because of that, I wanted to be an Olympic skier. Um, so if I can give that to even one kid, you know, I think that's a success and just encouraging them to be themselves and to believe in themselves. And you'd be surprised how many people tell children they can't do something. And um, that's very discouraging. And so I just try to build them up, give them the tools they need to, to succeed and to continue to believe in themselves. And um, we've had an amazing success so far. And it's been one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in my life. Well, I, I love that mission. Uh, to inspire and to inspire young people and uh, hopefully that is what NBAA base has been able to do by having a number of people on this stage capable of opening hearts and firing imaginations. I think what we want to do is send a message out that everyone can be part of something great and our industry can help facilitate that as we grow and find people in every corner of the world, in every segment of society, and let them know you belong, you have a community. And whether that's uh, business aviation or even beyond the borders of that, this is a time of opportunity. And having people like you be able to give that message is empowering to all of us, either as a young person or as someone who can reach out and mentor and help. And I wanna just underscore what you said. You never know when a nine-year-old Lindsey Vaughn is asking you for an autograph and deciding how they are going to change their lives based on the way you respond. Thank you for being an example for us, a role model, and an inspiration. Ladies and gentlemen, Lindsey Vaughn.